Hi, I would like to welcome you to New Creation Fellowship Online Training Center. My name is Roy Williams. I'll be your instructor tonight. And we've been teaching on applied grace. And I always like to start off just with a reminder, letting each and every student know, or just say person, that grace is just basically receiving. And uh, I always like to go over and just deal with a couple of scriptures to give a little basis to what I'm speaking about prior to getting into the, uh, the lesson. And in the book of Titus, hopefully you have your Bibles and your pencils and your papers so you can keep notes. In the book of Titus, that's 2.11. Titus is in here somewhere. They always tell me the quickest way there is the table of contents. Right. You know, but uh, I'm going to hunt for it this time. But <laughs> in the book of Titus, it reads... Uh, It says, the grace of God that brings salvation, it says it has appeared to all of mankind. So grace is not something that's more just like given to a certain group of people. Grace is available to all who would receive. And it's so very important when I look at the, the grace, how gracious God is. God has given man everything that pertains to life and to godliness. And when you look at the, the grace of God, once again, you want to keep in mind just the basic definition is receiving what you don't deserve. I mean, the lady caught in the issue of uh, the lady caught in adultery. She, according to the law, deserved death. But life was standing right there to intervene. And Jesus was the life that came forth that more or less like not only saved the lady's life, but, but preserved her life. Now, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they could not condemn her because of Jesus. And because of the graciousness of Jesus, he would not condemn her. But the law brings death, but gra grace brings life. And that's what God has so graciously given each and every one of us. He's given us his grace. So once again, the grace of God that brings salvation. Notice it, notice it didn't say it's going to appear. It says it has appeared. Well, how do you know that? Well, turn with me, if you will, over to the Gospel of John. That's the Gospel of John. Chapter 1. And I'm going to start reading. In verse 14. Now we got to always remember, when Jesus appeared in the earth realm, grace appeared in the earth, ready and available for all men to receive. See, and I'm here again before I read this verse of scripture, I just want to just make a note that grace is not a subject study. Grace is a person. And it's a person that God says that he's going to put on the inside of man. So, Scriptures tells us, it's, it says, it's of grace that it might be of faith. See, it's not faith that it might be grace. No, it's grace that it might be of faith. And we know faith is a joyous, confident expectation of good. Now, who's good? God is good. And the Bible tells us in 2-4 Romans, it says, it's the goodness of God that leads man unto uh, repentance. And in other words, it's God's goodness. Hearing about the goodness of God is going to get you to change your mind. And not only about the God of the Bible, about yourself and about your surroundings, about who you are, who he is, and all that he's given, that you might rule as king in the earth. Okay, so how do I know that grace has appeared in the earth realm? So we always have to do is go to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, and we're going to look at verse 14. And it says, And the Word was made flesh, and it says, And it dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, it says, full of grace and full of truth. And in that same uh, chapter, we see also in verse uh, 17, we see the scriptures tells us that the law was given by Moses. It says, but grace and truth came by way of Jesus Christ. See, Moses gave the law, and the law, like I said earlier, represented death. But when Jesus came into the earth realm, all that he did for man, mankind as far as uh, him dying and living, he brought grace into the earth realm. Jesus was the open door that brought life to mankind. And see, any time when you look at scripture, you want to look at it in reference to how it relates to Jesus. He's the hub. He's the focal point. 
He's the very DNA of scripture that we have to see in everything that we look at. Because if you just look at grace as a subject, you're going to miss the benefit that God has for each and every one of us. Grace is not just a subject study. Grace, like I said, is a person. And that person is Christ Jesus. You hear what it says here. It says grace and truth came up close and personal. How did it come? By way of Christ Jesus. So we always want to look at the things God wants us to hold fast to. And those are some of the things that he wants to hold fast to. Like over in Hebrews chapter 10, I'm going to start reading in uh, verse 23. Just uh, uh, just a brief uh, review before I get off into the meat of this here. But it says, uh, it, it says, that's Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. It says, let us hold fast to the profession of our faith. It says, without wavering. He says, for he is faithful that promised this. That's why we can hold fast, not only to our profession, but to our confession. And if you look that word up, confession, it means the same thing in, uh, here as it means over in Hebrews chapter uh, 10, verses 9 and 10, when he says, if we confess with our mouth, it's just saying what God says. He says, hold fast to that confession or that profession, whatever it is, in accordance to your health, in accordance to your wealth, in accordance to your peace of mind, in accordance to the world, in accordance to your family. He says you hold fast to the confession because you always want to say what God says. And when you hold fast to the confession or that profession, or that joyous uh, expectation of good, know this for sure, that God is able to perform that in which you are holding fast to. Because God has created each and every one of us to live the good life. Because God is gracious. And that's, that was his intent from the beginning. And that's God's intent now. It's for you to live the good life. And we don't want to get weary in well-doing. See, you know what's going to make you weary when you start looking at what's going on around you. It's a lot of issues and situations going on in the world. That's why God always tells you, look unto Jesus. He's the author and he's the finisher of all that's going to take place in your life. And just understanding just the basic principles. There's principles in the scriptures, but there's also that inheritance. We're heirs, but are there principles? Yes, there's principles that we can operate in. One principle, just right off the bat, is Luke 6.38. If we give, we shall receive. That's a principle. It's a principle of increase. But be my, by me being rich is not based on a principle. By me being rich is based on my inheritance. I'm an heir with God and a joint heir with Christ Jesus. And so that's how you should look at that. When you go back and you look in scripture, you see how, how awesome God is. You go back and you look in Genesis 6, uh, uh, 6, 8, and it reads, it says, Noah found favor uh, with God. Notice that was, that was back before the law was even given. The law came 600 and some odd years later. But here God was still in being favorable with those in, in, that he has had dealings with. It says Noah found favor. And if uh, you look, I, I've, I've had a desire to always, you know, because I've heard throughout my years going to church that everything in the Bible had significance and it had meaning. So, I, you know, and I've heard people say certain things about names and numbers, et cetera, and so forth. And I just don't, once I hear something, I just don't say, oh, that sounds good, and say it. Oh, I go look it up. I don't care who it's coming from. It can come from him himself. But I got to see if it's true. Because he did say in Psalms uh, 34, 8, to taste and see that God is good. And then he also said, tell, told me to study, you know, to show myself approved unto him. So once I start doing that, you start getting an understanding about the significance of names and words and, you know, things that can add meaning to scripture. Because God wants us to have, have this for ourselves in a personal way, not just something we know. It's, 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 it's something that, that's a part of us as uh, his children. Because in the Old Testament, those individuals were servants. And see how God worked in and through their lives? I mean, he worked supernaturally. But guess what? In the New Covenant, in the New Testament, we're sons. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. So you have the power to live this life. And you know what's so awesome about this God of the Bible? He says, I'm going to take myself, this infinite God, he says, and I'm going to put myself inside of you. Now, uh, that's why you have things, you're like a cup running over. 
But so in order for man to, for God to be able to fit inside of mortal man, he had to stick him, he had to put himself inside of Jesus. And then he says, I'm going to put Jesus inside of you. So the fit is perfect. I'm a perfect individual based on what Jesus has done, not only in me and through me. But the word like the Bible over in 6, 8, Genesis is that but Noah found favor. So any time you see that word favor, he's actually talking about grace. Now notice he it didn't say he had to work for it. He says he found it with this God of the Bible. N notice it didn't say he had to plead for it. No, he says he found favor. And, and Noah's name actually means rest. See, so he's at, you, I, I don't think I would be taking anything away from this verse of scripture in that I might say it uh, this way. In other words, since his name means rest, it means when you rest, you find favor with this God of the Bible. See, and that's what grace is all about. Grace is just receiving what I don't deserve. Roy, you don't deserve that. I know it. That's what makes it favor. If I deserved it, then it wouldn't be favor. See, that's how you want to see everything. I said everything that God gave to man. He gave to man based on favor, based on a promise. And when you look here again, I, I got to just stress this point. <clears throat> when you look at how God operated in the lives of those that were in the, under, in the Old Testament, <clears throat> it was always based on what they saw what they believed, what they received. And it wasn't based on them actually possessing the, the, the very thing. See, we possess the, the very substance. We, no, they, they had a substance. We had the very person of Christ Jesus. See, they was looking toward what God had promised. We look back on what God has promised. But that promise was that promise seed that God promised that would come forth through Abraham by way of Mary and Jesus Christ would be that door that man would be able to enter and to receive all of the goodness, all that God intended for man to have in the beginning. And so God, he's an awesome God. So we see that Noah found favor with God and even when God had brought the children of Israel out of Egypt Notice what he said over here in 321 of Exodus. He says, I will grant this people favor. And, and you know, in the sight of the Egyptians or in the sight of the world. See, Egypt represented the world during that time. And he says, and it shall be that when you go, he says, you won't go empty handed. Now, they was just, they was just servants now. <laughs> he said, you won't just go empty handed. And you know what I like about that too when he brought them out? They was healthy. They didn't get drug out. They didn't get pulled out. They didn't get carted out. No, they walked out. Millions. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, they were healthy, wealthy, and in their right mind. Now, when I look back on how he dealt, now this was prior to the law too, you know, a lot of, a lot of this stuff that was taking place like in Abraham's life and in Noah's life. When you look back on how God dealt with them, notice what he says in Hebrews chapter 8. Verse 6, but now, you know, he said, now, hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which is established upon better promises. See, when you look at the promise God made with mankind, you got, you got to always remember that promise is in stone. See, and the covenant that he cut, he said, it wasn't the covenant like the one of old. See, that covenant in the Old Testament was based on the blood of bulls and goats. But yet, for one year, the sins of man were covered just because of the blood. See, the emphasis is up on the blood, not up on the sin, because that's been done away. But see, under the new covenant, it's been totally done away with. And you know, and it was brought to my attention and I thought on the matter a little while you know I pondered it <laughs> and it was good Watch, this is good see and because of the blood of Jesus we should not have a sin conscious about nothing because see if they could be forgotten for one year I said totally no it was a, a reminder in that because they would have to do it year after year. But because of the blood of Jesus, it tells us in 10-2 that 
Now let me start at 10.1 of Hebrews. It says, For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the thing, can never, with those sacrifices that they were doing back there, which they offered year by year, it was a reminder of sin, continually make the comers therefore per perfect. He said, verse 2, he says, For when, for then, would they not cease to be offered, but because the worshippers once purged should have no more consciousness of sin. Hmm. Shouldn't even think about it. Why? Because he done away with it. All of it. Period. So, when you think about situations, you know what you should be thinking? That you're righteous. You should have a righteousness consciousness. That's regardless of what takes place in your life. Because I know mistakes will be made in a person's life. So we see that God wants us to hold fast the confession or the profession of our faith. He, he says he wants us to hold fast to that. And see, and that profession or that confession should be centered around and up on uh, his word. Because when you look how good this God of the Bible is, God has given us all things. He says all things that pertains to life and to godliness. And right here, you know, most, most people know things according to, you know, how they're saved and so forth. And so forth. People, some people know that they're justified. A few people know that they're righteous. And even less know that they walk in divine health. Why don't they know that? Because they're not getting into the scriptures and teaching it out to themselves, speaking to yourself. And like I'll, I've said this once, and I'll, I'll say it several times uh, again before the teaching is over. The most powerful voice in the earth realm is yours. God has given you a voice in the earth. You say, but they're not listening to me. He is. He's listening to you. Your body's listening to you. Your circumstances are listening to you, especially when you're speaking in reference to the things of God. And God has given every man the measure of faith. In other words, God has given you the ability to have a joyous, confident expectation of good. He's given you that ability. And see, even the faith to believe this, it's not yours, it's His. See, everything that you have in life, I don't care what it is, it came from Him. And they're all a part of grace, of, of the grace of God. There's, there's, there's many forms, there's, there's several forms to, to, to God's grace. And, and you know, and when you look at it, you just look at, you know, just based, just like, just looking at healing. You know, like, I just want to, just, just, I just want to go to, let me see, uh, uh, Numbers chapter 5. And just show you how, how in the Old Testament a lot of this stuff meant death. Go to Numbers chapter 5. You might have to go to your table of contents on this one. But it's about the fourth book of the Old, of the Old Testament. Chapter 5 of Numbers. And uh, the way they got rid of situations in the Old Testament, they would kill those that, that, that committed the offense. But see, under the New Covenant, they don't kill the person that made the on offense. They put all of the offenses on, on Jesus, and then he died for each and every offense. And so when you look over in chapter, Numbers chapter 5, Moses is basically telling exactly what happens to those that want to live under the law. Watch this. It says in Matthew, uh, I'm in, in, in Numbers chapter 5, I'm going to start reading in, in uh, verse 1, and it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they be put out of the camp. Watch this. Every leper, this is people, what's it, what's it, everyone that has an issue, well, with blood, and whosoever is defiled with the dead. That's old covenant. So you had to get put out of the camp. You can't even be a part of the community or the family. Watch this here. Now, in reference to the leper, Matthew chapter 8, the first thing Jesus did when he came down Mount of Olives, he healed the leper. See, where in the Old Testament was death, in the New Testament, we talk in life. This is, this is important to understand. You see, 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 that's why we have a better covenant based on better promises. And see, and then, so, okay, well, what about th these other two issues here? Okay, what about the, uh, the lady with the issue of blood? He healed the individual that had, the lady that had the issue of blood for, what, uh, tw uh, 12 years? He healed her. 
See, so in the Old Testament, it meant death. In the New Testament, it meant life. Now, all of, see, and even when you get to the, to the, even in the Old Testament, if you touched a dead body, you were considered unclean. Right? But when Jesus ran into a dead body, he spoke life into a dead thing. Lazarus, come forth. So you see, this is why we have a better covenant. This is why it's based on a better promise. See, and healing is one of the graces of God that a few people are, 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 are not really aware of. That it's by grace through faith that all of this is pertained to uh, obtain. The promises of healing is available to every believer in every situation. I don't care who you are or what the situation is. Turn to uh, Romans chapter 11. Uh, uh, Romans 8. Romans chapter 8. That's why <clears throat> you want to always look at this better covenant. And that better covenant that God is sitting forth in, in Scripture, in New Testament, it's one of grace. It's a, it's a covenant of grace. That's how you receive from God. Because, see, if I, ha if I have to work for, to receive anything from God, watch this. He doesn't get the glory. I end up trying to get it. And say, God said he gets all of the glory. So even though you're going to get the victory in every situation, he has given it to you. So um, this is in reference to healing of your mortal body. It says, 8, 8, 11, Romans chapter 8, verse 11 says, But if the spirit of him, notice that's, that spirit is S. It's a capital S, so that means it's talking about the Holy Spirit. Of him that raised up Jesus from the dead, notice it, dwell in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall. You, you know, I, I had opportunity to, to you know, cross-reference a lot of scriptures, you know, old and new. And a lot of times when the translators uh, translate a scripture, they try to give emphasis to a verse or to a chapter or to a word or whatever. And they put words in that, that didn't really go into that, that text of that, that, that verse of scripture. And like if you look at the word shell in Hebrew and in Greek the word shell does not exist that's something you're going to have to check out for yourself say where you get that at check it out for yourself see because God is not going to do anything he's done it all God is now he's not yesterday or tomorrow he's now see and that's what a lot of people miss God because he says what God is going to do well if God is going to do something that means he hasn't done it so somebody is not telling the truth so notice what it says here. I always like to say what he says. That I am. Notice what it says right here in 11. He says, I'm going read to read, start from the beginning again in verse 11, Romans 8. He says, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he says, he that raised up Christ from the dead quickens your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. And say, either, hey, the man said I'm healed. So what do you mean, I'm, I shall be? No, I'm healed now. I'm receiving mine now. You might want to see, receive yours 25 years from now. I'm receiving mine right now. Me. See, that's how you want to work with this God of the Bible. God is now, always. He's present tense. And that's a perfect tense in some situations. But he's, hey, God is present tense. So God is saying, this spirit that dwells in me. He says, see, this body here is immortal. I mean, mortal. That means, in other words, it's decaying. So, and you, but you know what I like? He, he's, he's put that Holy Spirit uh, inside of me. He says, it's like earnest money when you put down on a, a house you're getting ready to purchase and so forth. What, what, what do you put that, that Holy Spirit in, in me for? He says, that I, I will receive a, a new body, a glorified body, one that's immortal, that one that will never die. But why I'm here, he stuck himself on the inside of me that that Holy Spirit, his Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of me and you will quicken or make alive this mortal body. See, that's always my intention. To always see and say what God says. Even though there's circumstances or situations going on around me. Even though I'm in the world, I'm not of the world. And Christ lets me know one thing. God lets me one thing. No, he lets me know one thing. If I say what he says, I have now, right now, what he is saying to me. So he's telling me healing Healing is mine. He says, just like in the Old Testament, God blessed them 
through grace, mercy in every situation and circumstance. But those things were types and shadows of what was to come, but not the very thing. We have the very thing. Christ is the very thing. And that's what you want to get in mind. See, so God's grace is God's love in motion. That's what grace is. It's just receiving. That's all it is. No, grace is not working. Gr say, grace and works don't coincide. They don't go together. It's grace and grace alone. We've taught in this ministry for years. Uh, this church is teaching Jesus plus. No, it's not Jesus plus. It's just Jesus. And so if, so if Jesus is grace, that's all it is. He, that's, he said, just receive me. And see, we're receiving, we're receiving this based upon a finished work. I don't have to qualify in order to receive from what God has already given me. It's just like my family member passes, leaves me an inheritance. I don't have to work to get that. All I have to do is go and receive that. That's all. And that's how it is with this God of the Bible. He says, I'm an heir, a joint heir with Christ Jesus. So all that he has left me, it belongs to me. It's mine. And then he tells me that the righteousness that he has given me, it's not even mine. He says he has declared me right and he has made me right. And no one can make, bring a charge against me. Sometimes I'll be trying to charge myself. <laughs> he, said, he said, I can't even bring a charge against myself. <laughs> Amen. So that's how uh, God's, he's, uh, God is awesome. When you look at how awesome, you know, he just put things together. No, in a life and, and just uh, in the earth realm. So when you hear the grace of God, you can, you can just more or less like say you're talking about the Son of God because that's, that's who Jesus is. Jesus is grace personified. Not only is he grace, he's grace and truth. They're, they're synonymous. They, they, they go together. That's, that's who Jesus is. See, the first coming of Christ in, uh, in essence is the personal manifestation of God's grace. That's what it is. Jesus himself never really used the word grace. He didn't go around preaching grace. You know what Jesus did? He went around demonstrating grace. So, and that's when I used the illustration already, already with the lady caught in the act of adultery. See, he demonstrated grace there. And you know what I like about it? He had opportunities to minister to every person there. But if that lady, I believe, was the only one that received at that, that, that point in time. And then also when he raised Lazarus from the dead, he exercised the gift of life. He exercised grace there. But Lazarus was his, you know, Lazarus was his, was his friend. See, Martha had a works mentality. She was trying to work and try to please Jesus. But you know what Mary did? Mary, she had a, a receiving mentality. She was receiving from God and, she, and, he, and that's why Jesus said Mary has chosen the better part and he says it will not be taken away from her well it ain't going to be taken away from me either. I'm not letting it go I'm telling you because once you find the truth I mean you in, once you start to embrace the truth it becomes a part of your life so that's why you get to let this word just rule and reign in your thoughts and, and meditate and ponder and think and speak the things that God says that are yours, regardless of the circumstances. It says, grace and peace, it says over first, first, uh, first Peter. Turn over to First Peter chapter 1. No, it might be Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 1, it says... No, 2 Peter chapter 1, <laughs> verse 2. A lot of times, see, we, we know a lot of this stuff, you know, and it's good, you know, it's good to know this, this the things that God is speaking to you. See, and knowing is just having the knowledge of it, and, that, and that's good, you know. And, but, see, if you never speak what you know, you'll never have the things that he says, basically, that is yours. And it's just, you know, you said, but that's not a work. No, that's just how God letting you know that, th th how he brings things into the earth realm. You have to speak them. But first of all, it says, First Peter, I mean, excuse me, Second Peter, chapter 1, verse 2. 
It says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through how? Through a knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now he's telling us grace and peace is going to be multiplied to us. But it's going to, be, it's going to come through knowing. It's going to come through knowing what grace is and, and, and what peace is in accordance to scripture, not in accordance to the world. And it's good that you know this stuff. And I know you know. But when was the last time you spoke what you know? See, because that's, 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 that's more just like imitating the Father. He told us to imitate him. He told us to copy him. He told us to follow him like a son would imitate or copy or follow his father. So it's good that you know it, but it's going to be to your benefit if you speak it. See, because when you speak it, that means you believe it according to scripture. See, once you speak it, when you, and, and I'm going to read verse 3, and it says, according, that is 1 Peter chapter 1, verse, I just read 2, verse 3, it says, according to his divine power, he has given us to us all things that pertains to life. He has given us to us all things that pertains to life and godliness uh, uh, through how? Through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue. He says, whereby are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises. See, they had, they had great promises back. But he says, ours is exceedingly great and precious promises that you might be, listen to this here, partakers of his divine nature. In other words, you're going to take on his DNA. That's just what he's actually saying. Because man was, in the beginning, created in his image according to his likeness. So Adam had the very makeup, the very DNA of God living on the inside of him until he decided to move in another direction. But God restored that relationship with mankind. And in 2 Corinthians, let me get over there and I'll tell you what the address is. Let me see what's that. Second Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 18. This is why we always want to be looking under Jesus. He says, but we all with open faces beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed. It's saying that we're changed by beholding. By looking at, listen, look, it's saying that we're changed by beholding into the same image from glory to glory to glory even unto more glory. Even as by the same even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So God is telling me, as I behold him, I'm changed. I'm transformed. I'm metamorph metamorphosized into the same image of the Son. Just by beholding him. You're going to be, and actually, you're going to become what you're looking at. You're going to become what you're listen, who you're listening to. That's why Jesus says, be careful on how you hear. See, so the things I want to hear, I want to hear in accordance to Scripture. That's all I want to hear. Now, do issues try and bombard my life? Yes, they do. But guess what? God is teaching me and continues to teach me that I only want to hear what he's saying. And I only want to say what he's saying. Because therein is life. Over in uh, Psalms chapter, chapter 4. Psalms chapter 4. I had a script here, but uh, you know, anytime you have a script, you know, you start talking, you just start listening. <laughs> oh, no, I mean, excuse me, Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. Yeah, and it's in reference to what this word is to a life. It reads, it says, I'm going to start reading chapter 4 of um, Proverbs. And it says, I'm going to start reading in verse 20. He says, my son, he says, attend to my words. He says, incline, incline thy ear unto my sayings. He says, let them not depart from, from thine eyes. He says, I want you to listen to them. I want you to look at them. He says, keep them in the midst of thy heart. He says, because if you do, he says, they are life. His word is unto 
to, to those that find them and health to all of the flesh. Not some of it. What is? Now, I would never ever tell you don't go to the doctor, but I, I believe he just told me, he says, uh, he says his word is health to uh, all of my flesh. And then he says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So God is telling me his word is life to my life, is health to my flesh. And when I go and I look at uh, 2 Corinthians 2, 9, let's go to 2 Corinthians, so I, want, uh, I don't want to misquote scripture. 2 Corinthians. No, yes, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I'm going to start reading verse 9. It says, uh, that's 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9. says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I think a lot of people miss that, that those first three ver words there. It says, for you know. See, so he's talking to somebody that know. Uh, he's talking to somebody that should know. He says, know the grace. Notice he says, he don't say, he don't say works. He always like to put that out. Uh, notice he don't say the law here, for you know the law. No, he says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, you know, yet for your sake uh, he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. So we have here a divine transference. It's just like there was a transference of health to the leper when Jesus touched the leper. See, normally when a person touches uh, an unclean thing, that person be unclean. But when Jesus touched the leper, the unclean became clean. That's awesome. See, that shows you there was a transference. Not only did he take our poverty, he took all of our sickness. I said every bit of it. I said all of it. But why aren't you walking in divine health? Because you're preaching a works grace mentality. That's it. And that's what's coming from the church. They're telling you, yeah, okay, yeah, it's grace, but... No, when you hear that word, but you better run. I'm telling you, no, there's no mixture here. None. No, and it's, all, it's grace and it's grace only. That's how you receive all of this. Just, re just receive a finish. See, when Jesus said that it is finished, when I hear the word finished, that, that to me, that means done, complete, nothing else, nada, no more. That's what it means to me. Now, a lot of times people try to read in. I read around, I read over, I read under a lot of the stuff the scripture is saying. No, you just want to read what's there and not try to read out of what's not. There. You just want to read what the scriptures say. He's telling us right here there was a transference, a, a total transference of poverty. He took on all of our poverty, not some of it, all of it. He took, look, watch this. He took all sickness. If Jesus left out one, he left them all out. You got, you got to know that. See, but see, God's grace is complete. It's whole. And there's nothing missing. See, when Jesus stepped out of eternity into time, it's just like the superior bowing to the inferior. So you had, you had God's ear. You actually had audience with the king. And it's his, through his word, through the word that he became, that all things are held together. It's by, it's, it's by the word. It was by the word all things that were dis, that had disorder, that was dark and there was no form. It was the word that brought everything back into order. And that's the same word that's going to bring things in order into your life. I don't care what's going on. See, no, see, when God looked out, he says it was dark and it was void and there was no order. There was no form or whatever. He just said, oh my goodness, Jesus, we got an issue here. No. He looked out in Jesus and God just spoke and brought order to chaos. And you can do the same thing. See, but God believed when he was spoke. When he, when, he, when he spoke, he believed what he was speaking. See, and he knew that the, that, that the end that he spoke was there prior to him even speaking. And that's how you have to see it. You've got to speak it just like God speaks in a life, in a situation, in circumstances. You've got to say what God says. Because once you do, no one thing for sure. 
He that promised it is able to perform it. And see, and you want to hold fast the confession. You want to hold fast the confession of your faith. See, understanding what grace means requires our going back and you, you know, and looking at it in you know, in an Old Testament sort of way, somewhat. It's just like it meant back, you know, if you look at it in, in, in Hebrew, well, it, it somewhat means favor, but it also meant to, to stoop or to, or to bend. And anybody that has been around royalty, you'll, you'll, you'll notice a lot of times, you, you know, they would bend or they would curtsy or uh, to those that were of lower degree than they were, or they would show favor and kindness by going over there, you know, meeting a uh, personal need of whatever. That person, they might not even know that person that, 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 that's of a lower degree, but they might go over and, and, and meet a need, you know, on, and uh, with money or food or, or gesture or whatever, to an undeserving pay, a person, that's showing favor. See, that's how God is. God not only bent down to our level, he stooped down to our level because he's good and he wants us to know whatever it takes to bring you up he says I'm not gonna spare the expense so he sent his son he sent Jesus into the earth realm so man can be totally fully wholly restored back back not only back unto him but back unto himself so he can know who he is see because once you find out who God is you're gonna know who you are and like I continue to say God is good. So the grace of God that brings salvation, the Bible tells us, it says it, it has appeared. It's here. It's now. It's not going to be. It's here. And it's now. God has given us all things that pertains. He's given us all things that pertains to life and, and to godliness. And God is able, the Bible tells us. It's the, the, you know, because a lot of times, you know, we have a, a works mentality. We think we're able to do anything. The Bible tells us God is able to make all grace abound. It's him. And he did that in Christ Jesus. He says, every favor, every earthly blessing, may it come to you in abundance, so that you may always and, in, and under all circumstances, and whatever the need be, self-sufficient, possessing enough to require no aid or support, and furnished in abundance for every good work and charitable donation. Now notice he says it's not of yourself. He says God is able to make all this happen. You know I thought if I get a you know real good job I'll be able to take God's place. No. Uh -uh. <laughs> no. You're not going to make enough to fit in what I just read here. No, no, listen what it said here. You're not going to make enough of this. <laughs> he says no, no, watch, I'm going to read this. It says, God is able to make all grace abound, every favor, every earthly blessing come to you in abundance so that you may be, so that you may always and under all circumstances and whatever the need be, self-sufficient, possessing enough to require no aid or support and furnished in abundance for every good work and charitable deed, charitable donation. See, God has already, you've already become an heir to receive all that God has given you. That's why when I think, I was thinking while I was studying and so forth, that's why Abraham told that individual when he had come back from, from war and they had all the spoils of war laying, laying there and he told Abraham he can take whatever. Uh, Abraham says, uh -huh, no man will never ever say that he made Abraham rich because Abraham knew where his source was. See? And that's where we want to come to. We want to come to understand God has blessed us. He has richly blessed us with all things and he has freely given them to us in uh, Romans 8 32 it says let's turn over there real quick before we run out of time Romans 8 32 because Romans 8 32 reads it's Romans Chapter 8, verse 32, it says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. He says, How shall he not with him freely give us all things? Notice it says in, in the Amplified, it says, He who did not withhold or spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also with him freely and graciously give, graciously give us all other things? things. Anytime I hear that word all, that don't leave nothing out. All right. I said it doesn't leave anything out, so not to me. 
See, a lot of times, you know, like they used to call on the phone and say, Oh, uh, uh, is this Mr. Williams? Yes, this is Mr. Williams. They said, we have a free gift for you, and all you would have to do is come down and make a drawing, and once you make the drawing, uh, the gift is yours. I would go down and get down, I would make the drawing, and you know, and everything was good for a minute, but once I get that ticket and I open it, he says, I find out it's not free. But, so that, that word free was misused by that person that indicated to me that this gift that they had for me was free. Now when something's free, that means there's nothing attached to it. And that's what God is saying. He said he didn't spare his own son. He says that everything that he has for you, he says, he says you can freely receive it because it's all based on grace. Even when it's time for you to leave the earth realm, all you have to do is die in Christ. That's all you have to do. And you are heaven bound. So a lot of times people say, well, you got to work to get to heaven. No, you don't have to work to get to heaven. If I have to work to get to heaven, that means God doesn't get any of the glory. And then it becomes a work. No, all I have to do is receive to get to heaven. Receive what God has provided. He's made provision for me to, to step out of time into eternity. And that provision is Christ Jesus. So the graces that God has given each and every one of us is a grace that we all receive and we receive it freely. And saying all this is received by faith. And I always like to just keep in mind, keep this fresh in the minds of those that are listening. See, faith a lot of times is not be able to quote Hebrews 11, chapter 1. No, faith doesn't have any substance without hope. Hope has to be there. If hope is not there, you don't have faith. You'll have faith, but it's not the biblical kind of faith. And for years I was being taught faith one-sidedly. I hope I said that right. One-sidedly, is that a, a good sentence? Yeah, that's a good sentence. Yeah, but see, but once I've come to find out that hope was very significant, very important to faith having any substance, then I had a better understanding about what grace was all about. Now remember, grace is God's love in motion. And now once you say that you are operating in faith, you will always, in every situation, every circumstance, watch this, have a joyous, confident expectation of good. Because that's what hope is. Hope, and, and, and knowing that he who had promised it is able to perform what he promised. And I would like to basically close with this verse of scripture that I kind of like opened with. That's Hebrews chapter 10. That's why Abraham was, could hope. When there was, was no hope, he says, I'm going to hope anyway. Why did Abraham hope anyway? Because he knew that he who had promised was able to perform that in which he promised. And that's why you're able to come boldly to the, to the throne of grace because of, well, I think that's 10.23. 10.23 of, of Hebrews. I'm going to read it again. Now, based on what God has given us all, has given all to us, he's given us health in abundance. He's given us wealth in abundance. He's given us peace. He's given us all things that pertains to life. And I used to think I, everything God had for me, I'll get it when I get to heaven. No, no, no. He says he's blessed with all things here in this earth realm. You heard what he says over in Ephesians 2.10. He says he created us to live the good life right here, right now. Not when I get to heaven. That, I'm, that, that, that we could be a blessing in the lives of others and be able to give to every charitable organization and situation. Be able to support our, ourselves and not having any need of support. See, God says if you preach this, you can live by it. Preach the gospel, but not any gospel. He said he wants you to preach the gospel. Now, which is the good news. So, so in Hebrews 10, 23, he says he wants us to hold fast to these confessions, our professions of hope. So he wants us to always have a joyous, confident expectation of good without wavering. Without wavering in a situation. He doesn't, and see, that's what, that's what Abraham didn't do. He didn't waver in, in, in the situation. At least God didn't think he did. So I got to go along with God there because if he did, God would have brought it up in, 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 in the, under the new covenant. No, he didn't waver. He says he was fully assured. Why? Because he knew that God who had promised it was able to perform in which he promised. And we see that here again too when he says let us hold fast in Hebrews 10, 23. He says let us hold fast the profession of our, our hope. He says without wavering for he who had promised it is able to perform that in which he promised. Watch this and uh, I want you to hear this in the, in the Amplified. 
That's Hebrews 10, 23. See, it says, let us seize and hold fast and retain without wavering the hope we cherish and confess and our acknowledgement of it. For he who promised is reliable, sure, and faithful to his word. This is the God we serve. So, if so God says all things are yours, they're yours. Don't receive it when you look at it. Receive it when you say it. God wants you to receive wholeheartedly all that he has for you. He's given it to you freely, and that's how he wants you to receive it. He wants you to receive it. He wants you to receive it freely. So we don't want to be operating in a church that's powerless. We, want to, we don't want to just have a form of godliness. We want to, we don't, we want to operate in the, in the power that God has given us. So our power is not outside. Our power is on the inside of each and every one of us. And that power is a sure hope. It's a living hope. And it's, a, it's the hope of glory. And the Bible says it's Christ in us. That's where God says, <coughs> excuse me, that his hope lives. God's hope lives on the inside of us. <coughs> so we don't have to qualify for anything. Jesus qualified for all things. See, once you try to qualify for the things that God has so freely uh, given you, in other words, you put work in front of uh, God's grace because notice I said earlier it says it's of grace that it might be of uh, faith you're going to nullify the things that God has already given you it's not that he's not giving you see grace is constantly flowing it says that but you're in the way see you're trying to add something to it or take something away from it when God says all you need to do is just freely receive this and uh, in Galatians chapter 5 verse 4 the Bible reads it says Christ is come of no effect Christ is come of no effect unto you, whosoever you are that think that you are justified by the law. He says you are fallen. Uh, he says you are fallen by grace. So if you think the law or the works of the law uh, is going to help you, it says, well, Christ is, uh, is going to become of no effect or ineffective in your life and in your situations. See, because he says you have fallen or moving. Notice he didn't say you lost your salvation. That's what I picked up when I was studying that. Thank you, Holy Spirit. He said, he didn't say you lost yourself. He says, you just fallen from receiving. Confidently, joyously, and expectantly of God's goodness. That's what he's saying right here. He says, why? Because you're trying to add something to it. God has given each and every one of us everything. And he's given it each and every one of us everything graciously. So the grace of God that brings salvation. It's, it, it has appeared. How did it appear? It appeared in the person of Christ Jesus. That's how it appeared. And God says, notice it, notice it says, don't you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ? See, even the prosperity is a grace of God. The healing is, the grace, is a grace of God. See, God has given, you know why he gave it to man freely? So he can take the work mentality out of it. So he says, I'm going to just give it to you free. And I'm going to give it to you even if you don't deserve it. And that's how you want to receive it. That's why Jesus, the last one of the last things he said before uh, on the cross, he said it is finished. So we want to rest in a finished work. And remember grace is just receiving what you don't deserve. I want to thank you for your time and uh, we'll be uh, expecting a response paper and a response paper is just simply uh, stating what you've learned and what you expect to do with what you learn. We love you and hopefully what you've heard uh, explodes in your spirit because like they always say your turn is up at bat because God is teaching that you might be a teacher. We love you and see you next time. Amen? Praise God.